Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of our Devon and Beyond series. These series are uh, hosted on Cloud Customer Connect, which is our Oracle community forum for customers and end users. And also, you this series take you through various topics and activities related to building out on Oracle Cloud. You can create a free account in Cloud Customer Connect to join in discussions, post questions, and, and look for upcoming events on various topics. We have a quick poll on the screen to get an understanding of everyone's level of experience with cloud and Oracle Cloud infrastructure. This helps us in customizing our content for the upcoming session. So we'd really appreciate if you would take a second to respond to this poll. This session is being recorded and uh, you'll be able to find the recording on Cloud Customer Connect. You can also find the recordings and a slide deck PDFs of our previous sessions over there. I'm Renu Bhatt, a TPM with the Customer Enablement Team. And today I'm joined by Anand Prasad, Cloud Architect, Lynn Lewis, Senior Cloud Engineer as the main presenters. And joining us as an expert today is Jason Cook, Master Principal Cloud Architect here at Oracle. Like always, a quick reminder to use the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen for any questions throughout the session. And today our topic is cloud operations. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Anand. Thank you, Reno. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you're all enjoying the, the day so far. Um, with that, I wanna dive into the presentation. So I think today's, I think we wanna focus on what is a day in the life of a operation engineer or a DevOps, or you can also known as a full stack engineers, right? What does OCI provides you to make your life better? Okay, okay. What are the capabilities, the tools, and everything we provide from understanding your life, and how can we make it very, very simple? Now, the three topics we want to cover today is what is the understanding the operations on the OCI landscape of things, like you're migrating your workloads. How do you want to use our tooling? Like you know, what are the tools we provide you from an OCI perspective? And last but the least, like you know for managing the workloads at cloud scale. I think my colleague Lynn is going to come and talk about it from a monitoring perspective and all, how do you manage it from, from at the cloud scale. Before I dive into the story, which I talk about a day in the life of an operation engineer, what do you mean by day in a life, right? You know, different people have different tasks, different roles, like, you know, at, at, in, in the industry from an operation side of the perspective, how does your day in a life looks like? And what is the OCI is going to provide you to help you to make your life better, run very efficiently, and from a tooling perspective, from a capabilities perspective, okay? And this is a slide I think you see in every section of our, our day one and beyond is because we want to communicate to you, there's a shared responsibility between the cloud vendor, which is OCI in this case, as well as the customer. Like depending upon the type of service you choose, like you know whether it's SaaS, PaaS, and IaaS, you have a different responsibilities you play from a security perspective and a compliance perspective. Okay. Now, from a landscape of things perspective, many of you know that Oracle was like you know a little late in the game for the cloud, but over the last five years, like you know we have built a lot of bells and whistles from across the landscape of cloud from a capabilities perspective, from like, you know, managing perspective, you can look at this slide and see that we have covered from, from a DevOps side of the fence, from an operation side of the fence, or your pure engineer wants to develop a lot of this AI ML applications, we have everything right now, okay? And that's the message we want to provide you is we have, we have come a long way in the last five years and we have the bells and whistles for you to bring your workloads in. But I'll go back into the day in the life of the operations, okay? Before I run dive into this slide, I want to bring my expert and talk about right. What are the challenges, right? You know, in your experience, Jason, right? You know, what are the challenges the DevOps engineers face today? I want you to talk about that. Thanks, Anand. That is a, a monster question. I could probably take the whole session here uh, if you'd let me on that. But let me talk about just two, a non-technical and technical example that I see out in the field pretty commonly. Um, first one is, is people scalability, you know, the, the people that are doing the work, you know, every company eventually comes across a point where they've got cost constraints, or minimally, they've got more work than people to do it, right? Very common challenge we all see. And I'd say for, you know, the, the folks getting started with the cloud, even the ones that have been there for a little while, one of the things you should be doing day one is building reusable deployable templates, you know, templates that have 
um, say configurations for your servers, for your storage, maybe a web stack that you can use and reuse, mature over time, add parameters to it. So you're not having to manually deploy things from the console, right? Learning and exploring via the console is fine, but eventually you've got to get to a template to deploy things. You know, in year one, maybe earlier, you should be using those templates to build self-service capabilities, right? So that if you've got high volume activities, you deploy a lot of servers, you've exposed that to customers, they can run it, and you're not always relying on your DevOps community to do that for you. I think also as you get to like year one to year two, you should be looking at how do you expand your DevOps community to encompass resources from across the organization, right? Not just your central org or not just your CCOE, but people that can code outside your organization. And that's how you kind of scale your resources out beyond what you may start with originally. From a technical side, the one I've seen recently a few times, it kind of boggles my mind still is secrets management, right? It's an old problem that, you know, people, you know, take our passwords or API keys and, and they put them in places where they shouldn't. Um, I, I've seen this here recently where we've had secrets hard coded into the actual code and scripts, local password files that are not encrypted. I've seen a few of those as well. And one of the things you should be doing in your organization is making sure that you pick a tool, right? There's plenty of third-party commercial software out there. You know, in OCI, we've got a vault tool that integrates very seamlessly with a lot of our tools to do password manage it and be able to call on that when you're deploying or when you're configuring. Um, you need to have ongoing training, right? This is not a one and done thing. You need to make sure all your development communities knows how to use this, especially as you onboard new members. And you got to have governance. You got to check for these things to make sure that API keys aren't being deployed along with, you know, your environment. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I think from from what I want to add to what uh, Jason is, like, you know, you provided a landscape of the challenges I think you guys face. But what I want to focus on, like, you know, two of those challenges, like, you know, from two roles, which we want to clearly define and then take it to the end, right? One of the role I want to talk about is like, you know, in the operation side of the fence, an engineering role where he wants to build, configure, and then monitor. Okay. That's the role I think most of the DevOps engineers right now do build and configure. The operation side of the role, make sure they manage it, protect, and secure and govern it. Right. You know, you, you want to divide that row, two roles into the into the conversation. Now, Lynn is going to come back and my colleague is going to talk about the monitor side of the fence. We are not going to spend a lot of time on the protect, secure, and governance because we are going to talk about that in the security side of the fence. We are going to come in and do a day one and, and beyond on a security side of the fence. So we talk about those three aspects of it, go down deeper onto the identity and access, how the policies are done and all those things. We are going to focus on the first two, three left-hand side of the things. The engineering side of the fence, which I call it developer side of the role, build and configure, operation side of the role, which is the monitor. So in a classic use case, the DevOps side type of role, okay? Or you can call it like, you know, right now, people call it full stack engineers and all those things, right? I'm going to spend a lot of time on like, you know, in a day in a life, if you're a, if a, if you have a dev operations uh, engineer who is mainly involved in developing things, what are the tools and OCI provides you for you to take advantage to make your life better, okay? I'm going to spend on that. Now let's jump into the next slide and I'm going to talk about like, you know, what does a, a scripting and automation capabilities OCI provides, right? If you want to control deployments, like, you know, a lot of people want to create infrastructures, you want to deploy applications. If you want to control, control deployments, like you want to have a centralized repositories where like, you know, whether it's GitHub, GitHub, and consistency is key. Like, you know, if you if you run this same type of scripting many times, you want to have a reliable output every single time, okay? Now, one of the things OCI recommends is like, you know, using Terraform, be it's an open source, um, like, you know, language, which is from Archicop, and we want to make sure we have built all our automation from an infrastructure perspective on Terraform. Okay, Terraform is our go-to language for us to automate anything you want to build in OCI. Okay, the last but the thing, of course, the version controls. If you want to have a version one deployment where you want to have like you know certain resources created and you want to come back and upgrade it or like you know enhance it, you can do the version controlling of your scripts. Okay, this is a generic requirement support automation from any customer which we have taken it as an example. Okay, there might be others, but this is source control should be there. Controlling deployments should be there and language, whether for the automation tool and et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at this slide, we are going to dive into this portion of it today. Okay. If you look at it, the 
I'm going to cover on the, the bottom right corner called resource manager. My mouse is moving on that side of the fence. So how do you make sure you build a stranded infrastructure using this automation, okay? Lynn is going to come and talk about like, you know, monitoring side of the fence, notifications, et cetera. We're going to cover those side of the fence so that you can go into the operation side of the fence, okay? Now, why is infrastructure as a code become such a popular thing in cloud? Um, it, the scripting has always been there from the, like, you know, long, long time, like, you know, when the computers were invented, everybody wanted automated. Automation is a, not a new thing, but infrastructure as a code became, took off, when cloud journey started very aggressively, right? Because what happened, everything is, is can be scriptable in cloud right now. All resources can, can is, it in the, is like, you know, they can have enhancing scalable options. It's infinite in a, in a cloud world so that you can script it and create your resources, okay? Now, a tool provides you a capability to like, you know, create a end state, and like, you know, you can create a scripted so that you can make sure your infrastructure can be scriptable, you can tear it apart, script it again, run the script again. So you can create the infrastructure in such an automated fashion. And across the, if it, and the, one of the advantages cloud made it more popular is because cloud has data centers across the globe and you can create the same infrastructure any region that you choose to, okay? Now, this is a sample um, view which we want to provide it from an OCI perspective. Think about this view from a cooking story perspective. Like, you know, we have chosen a, a region in Ashburn where you have network segmentation, like, you know, and availability domains and all those things. A region has generally in OCI, um, talking about OCI, we have one or more availability domains. An availability domain, just to provide you a little bit of more clarity on what does an availability domain means, it's a data center, okay? So a region has one or many data centers, and then a network segment taken can span across the multiple data center, what we call it as virtual cloud network. In this example, you can see a simple web application deployed front-ended by a load balancer. And if you want to automate this in like, you know, in a day, and I'll show you a simple e-commerce application also, how can you automate it and deploy it in your, at your fingertips. But if you just want to make sure, use this example and deploy it into OCI, how can you automate it and get a consistent deployment, okay, across the board? And that is what I think mm, we want to talk about it in next five to 10 minutes. What does OCI provide you from a tooling perspective to automate the infrastructure as a code is known as resource manager, okay? Resource manager is nothing but lets you automate the core infrastructure side of the fence, like you know, whether it's compute, storage, network, okay? You can create them, automate them so that you can get a repeatable results as I talked, right? And if you enhance it, you can run this second, lay, second version of it. You can get an enhanced, enhanced version of infrastructure day in, day out. And this takes out a lot of human error. This takes out a lot of like, you know, they sort of like, you know, thinking about remembering things and then human like action. So you can get a consistent output, whether it is a, if you have a bug in one of the regions, it'll, the bug will be across every region. So it is, the consistency is very high and also the reliability. And then, and from an SLA perspective, you can have a very consistent high available environments for when you created using the automation tools. Now, I talked about two roles. Like, you know, DevOps is what I covered, developers and DevOps, architects and IT operations. Like, you know, depending upon whichever role you play today, right? You know, you can assume that your day in a life and what are the capabilities OCI provides you, okay? Now, before I jump into the, the next question for J Jason, I'm going to talk about what does a resource manager is all about? I was talking about it's an automation tool. What we went in from an industry landscape of things is we, when we did a survey from an Oracle perspective, most of the companies use Terraform for creating the infrastructure as a code. And we built the tool resource manager with the Terraform in mind, okay? Because the, the industry has accepted Terraform as, as, as a standard language for creating infrastructure as a code. So the resource manager is nothing but Terraform as a service. In a one word, we want to make sure that the uptake of the tool is very easy for the people who are already working on Terraform. We want to make sure the resource manager follows exactly what Terraform follows, but 
We also want to provide you the bells and whistles of advantages of using Terraform. For example, right, managing a state file in, in Terraform is, is a nightmare. Managing drift is a nightmare. Once you create the infrastructure, rest assured, 99.99% people will go change it manually. How do you manage the drift? Like, you know, you created something in an automation tool. Somebody has went and modified it. How do you know that what is the drift? Resource manager helps it. There is a state file. People like either state gets the state file gets corrupted. And how do you know that what was created? And so you can enhance it or delete and recreate it. How do you manage the state file? Resource manager helps you to do that. The third pain point which we have seen is multiple people running the scripts at the same time. Resource manager takes care of it because we want to make sure when you run an automation tool, the consistency of the tool, the consistency of the process is maintained and no two uh, the processes is fighting for the same resources. Okay. And we want to make sure the tool uptake is very, very simple and it takes care of everything what Terraform done. Plan, apply, like, you know, you know and in it, in it, plan, apply, and destroy. So it just follows the Terraform side of the fence. Okay. Now, sample Terraform, Terraform, um, like, you know, snippets of code, like, you know, as I said, we have built the resource, resource manager in mind using the Terraform community out there so that you can uptake the resource manager easy. And also we have, we have told you about like some of the things with bells and whistles we have built on the top of it. Okay. Now, before I jump into the, the, the demo side of the resource manager, and I'll show you the how easy to uptake the resource manager, I want to bring in our industry expert Jason and talk about one more, like you know, like I want to give I want to ask him, like, you know, based on his experience, how is industry evolving from a tooling and capability for DevOps engineers? Right. You know, I'm pretty sure like a you know, resource manager is one tool which I talked about it. Let's hear from him about how industry is evolving from the tools and capabilities for DevOps engineers. Jason? Yeah, thanks, Anand. Um, yeah, I mean, you hit it on the head with that last slide about resource manager and drift detection. All cloud providers have that. And that's kind of the table stakes anymore when you have a DevOps shop to be able to identify that drift. Um, there's other tools that help you identify post configuration issues. Cloud Guard's a good one if you're looking for major security risks, vulnerabilities, patching. But where I see our industry starting to shift to is going from Detecting issues in your environment after they've been deployed, right? Drift detection is one of those things. Uh, Cloud Guard is one of those things. Like there's a bunch of tools to detect after you've deployed it to a shift to how do I detect something when I'm deploying it, right? During the actual deployment process. You know, something I hear often from customers that they're looking for is how can I get feedback during the deployment if there's an API key? you know, in my stack. Maybe I'm building out the, the web layer. I pulled in a, a server stack and some other things, and I didn't know that something was hard-coded in there. And I think that's what we're starting to see the shift in the industry is, I don't want to go back and fix something. I want real-time feedback to my developers. And I, I want to know, you know, at the time of deployment, fail my deployment, give me meaningful feedback, and give me the ability to actually do some corrective action so I can redeploy again. Now, there's some things that you can do even before that. There's obviously scanning of your code, your repos for those kind of issues, or scanning of your images. You know, we've got some of that with our Kubernetes service where you can make sure that your images don't have any vulnerabilities built into them. But I think this is still an opportunity for all the cloud providers, ourselves included, is we're starting to see the shift of, you know, help me prevent issues before they get in the environment by giving meaningful feedback during the deployment. I think you're gonna see some things out, you know, with third-party providers, as well as our own native cloud tools, you know, in the coming year, that helps address that common question I get back from customers is, how do I detect things during the deployment process? Perfect. As I, I think, thank you, Jason. I think as Jason was trying to, uh, uh, talked about Cloud Guard, Cloud Advisor, we at OCIS in incorporating a lot of this feedback, which Jason has already talked about, it's work in progress right you now. You can come back and get updates on this tooling. Like in you know, a cloud advisor is already tightly integrated with Cloud Guard. So that security side of the fence, you can get the, the, the adv advisories when you run the tool. So a lot more things is happening at OCI, but I quickly want to jump into the into the console and show you what I talked about it, right? As most of you have seen this, this is our OCI console. Okay. And hopefully you can all see my, my mouse moving in. On the left hand side, 
as on the you can see the amberg and this is the capabilities which i thought talked about it we have built a lot of capabilities bells and whistles in the last five years whether it's compute side of defense storage networking of course the databases we were the industry leading databases and then of course when i want to talk about it like you know from a resource manager if you talk about like you know you can have identity and access management perspective and developer services we have resource manager comes under the developer services okay now if you look at it we are creating sort of like a devops section also because we know that industry is moving towards a lot more uh, full stack engineers are, are moving towards that like you know devops like you know you develop it you deploy it you have to have the both ends of the uh, sites so now resource manager is one thing which is under the developer services when you click on resource manager i highly encourage you to go into oci console if you have an access and take a tour this is exactly the same thing which I talked about it like it provides you overview of if you have a Terraform background, you can easily learn about resource manager by taking a tour in a less than five to 10 minutes. OK, it's as simple as possible now. Now, if you also look at it, the resource manager, a lot of a lot of folks have already built up this infrastructure as a code because it is as a cloud journey. We already started planning this in 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 your in your uh, like, you know, journey. Like whether it's a Terraform already in source control, whether it is already an existing compartment, some of the folks in Cloud Native have started to do this. I've seen some customers go and create a compartment for a research project and start manually creating it. Like, you know, they create a lot of brainstorm ideas and everything. At the end of them, they say, wow, this output looks great. Let's automate it. They don't have to remember anything. They can reverse engineer and resource manager creates your Terraform's output for you. Okay. As long as you want, you can create it based on a service or you can create it across the service deployed in a compartment which in OCI. Okay. Now, stack is something which is a, it is nothing but um you create a stack from, from various resources. As I talked about it, you can create it from template, you can create it from an existing compartment, or you also create it from a source control. Let's create it from templates, right? Like you know, we have we also provide you a lot of pre-created templates for you to take advantage of it. One of the reasons we have provided it, you don't have to start from fresh. We have provided you templates where you can take it, you can modify based on your business requirements. Like we have, you have it something like 70 to 80% already done, but you can tweak it to based on your, cust your custom requirements or your business requirements and then use the use the templates okay so here is a template from like you know you can choose from an architecture perspective i have like you know a few templates there i i know i always i choose this the sample e-commerce application which gives you a breadth of things from web tier load balancer database which is a classic use case which i showed you earlier in the conversation okay now you can take this sample e-commerce and then select the template. Look at how, how easy to use a resource manager to create a stack, okay? Now it is already there. You can name it, like, and I'll name it as a day one, just to make sure you understand, day one and beyond. Sample application, I'll delete the rest of them. Sample e-commerce e app. And you can see that I'm deployed in the compartment. I can choose a different compartment if you want. I'll just take um, um, enterprise application compartments. And then I can add tagging for this. If you want, I can choose a tag. A tag. I've created tag namespaces. Very, very, very standard practices. Highly recommend tag namespaces. And the type of this I can choose is as dev. Like, you know, tagging is very, very critical to manage the resources better on cloud. And on the next slide, you know, it asks us the database name. What is the database you require? And then I think I'll take the default. And I think moving on, the stack is ready to create it. If you look at it, the stack, stack is there. Now I just created the stack. Now I've already created the stack just to make sure I show you for the for this particular uh, session which I was doing in. I already created the stack, and I'll show you what are the key capabilities the stack provides. I created the stack already. And I want to make sure I've done some sort of like a drift detection and all those things from the other stack, which I created earlier. So if you look at the stack, which I created, it has already been deployed right now. I just ran it. Now, if you look at one of the things which the resource manager helps you is no two processes run at the same time. Let me talk about it like running the drift detection right now. Okay. And I'll show you what happens, right? I ran the drift detection now to verify if there's somebody like Lynn might have went and changed something on this, uh, this particular stack. I'll run the drift detection. And I can see that work request has been submitted. If you look at it, everything is completely 
grayed out for me. I cannot run another action out of it. This gives you a capability for you to manage concurrent requests getting run by two different developers, as well as like state files and other critical sections getting corrupted and all those things. So we manage the infrastructure as, as a code is tightly managed. Now, I also talked about one other advantages of using resource managers managing the state file. Okay. This is always, when I was a developer, it's always being a nuance for me. Like, you know, state files gets deleted if somebody goes and uh, deletes it. So you can download the state file if you want to do that uh, state file. You can view the state file. I'll quickly view a state file. You can see that the whatever I've created right now is it in the state file. Okay. You can certainly download the state file right here. Okay. Now, and then also the, the drift detection report, when it completed, it is already done right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at the drift. I've intentionally done some of the drift just to showcase for this session. So let's do the drift detection report right now. If you look at it, I've deleted so many of the things after I created using the resource manager. Some of them have been modified, others have been synced. This is what bells and whistles the resource manager gives you is, if you create an infrastructure as a code and you deploy the infrastructure, and if you make changes, whether it is you or somebody in your team make changes, you can get it from the drift detection. And this is the process you want to do it from a business side of the fence. Like I'm not saying the drift is wrong, but how do you manage the drift is, the, is a very, very key thing in an organization. I'm not saying like, you, know, you should not go and make changes online, but you need to make sure the drift gets added into the next version of your resource manager so the consistency across the deployment may, gets maintained as well as the reliability is at high okay now that's that's in a nutshell is a resource manager i'll stop here and i'll hand over to my colleague to talk about the second side of the role which i i, I discussed with you right on the operation side of the fence where we talk about monitoring the notification, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Lynn is going to take you through that journey. Lynn. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen. So we're going to do a little slideware on um, monitoring aspect of the system. And then I'm going to go and show you where to find the information and the menus in the system itself. So first of all, let's talk about OCI monitoring. You can, you can imagine that when we were putting this together, we had to develop a methodology so that we could monitor <laughs> what was going on, right? You're going, to, you're going to create a worldwide distributed data center operation. You're going to want to make sure that you can have control over aspects of it, both the hardware and the software. So it is natural that we monitor everything. So every at the end of the day, everything that you do with respect to the UI or any of the other methodologies that you have to interact with the data center operating system, if you will, it, those are at their core REST APIs and they create different types of audit calls and system calls through the process. At the, the base, the easiest, as you're all familiar with, with your own operating system for your phone or for your, um, excuse me, for your laptop, is you have capability of the raw metric data. So how much CPUs you're using, how much memory you're using, how much, storage you're using. All those are available to you on each instance. Uh, likewise, in the operating in the operating system for the data center, we have similar capabilities and have provide and the operating systems for your virtual machines or in your bare metals provide metal instances provide that to us through our process. So you have metrics that you can monitor, then you can set up uh, data on an aggregated basis so that you can set all for all the CPUs on a, not excuse me, for all the CPUs on a virtual machine or on a cluster of virtual machines or bare metal machines. And then you can set an alarm or a trigger such that at a particular level, in this case, it shows below 80%, everything's fine. And above 80%, it's going to send you an alarm. And then you also have the ability to set 
how often those alarms are going to go off. Now, this is a very simple set of uh, instances where you would also get a message, but you can also do other things as well. So as I mentioned, you have complete control over every aspect of the kinds of events you have. So it's completely integrated with all our OCI services as well. So you have events, monitoring and the service connector hub, and it fully managed multi-tenant pattern. You have the ability to set these, set a notification, and then stuff happens, right? And it can be as easy as sending a, a note to your Slack channel. It can be an email to you or to someone else, and you can send it to a function, and then the function can act to for rumination or to correct the error or correct what's going on, add a, add a system to your cluster, that type of thing. You can have other ways of doing it as well, but you could, you could say, well, I have security issues because someone has accidentally um, created a, a pathway to our object store and made it public. Well, it can, you can be notified on that and the function itself will act to shut that down and make it private again. So these are the types of things that with a little, there's examples uh, that we, we provide in the documentation you can work with to work with the notification service where you do not have to do everything yourself and you can use it what, in a way that makes sense for you. So I've got sort of preceded some of this with the events. It's a structured, systemized method, method that, um, or excuse me, message that denotes a change in a resource. A rule is simply just that, that something happens and you trigger an action, and an action is a response. And the response can be anywhere from a function to an email. And a key element to this and to some of the other discussions we're going to have later on with respect to monitoring and measuring these capabilities is the fact that now Oracle is completely cloud events compliant. So what that means is that we had created in previous lives, right, um, an enterprise manager. If any of you are familiar with that, about 20 years ago, we initially put that together for our on-premise customers. And, and it was initially was simply for database monitoring. Well, now we have moved that into OCI, our, our cloud, and we have made it more standard. So a lot of these things that we're going to talk about can actually be uh, worked with through third-party tools, your own methodologies, but we're going to, we, we provide you with, with methods, methods as well. So Oracle functions, if you're familiar with a function in any other cloud, it's exactly the same. It's a service, uh, a container, and it, it, it has a capability of having the, to do small um, subroutines, if you will, or, or events uh, reaction to a circumstance. The, the idea is though, is opposed to where you have a container or a virtual machine that's running or provisioned with a specific amount of memory and a specific amount of, of OCPUs. In this case, it's, it's only event driven. So it only is, uh, you're not being pay, paying for idle time or those virtual machines or those containers. It's just waiting for something to happen. And if nothing happens, nothing happens. But, um, and, and it's something like a dollar for, for 50,000, <laughs> I'm exaggerating, for 50,000 emails, that type of thing. So it's not exactly going to break you. And the idea is that we want you to be notified and we want you to be happy with the value of this service. Now, if you remember, we were ta I was talking about the, the different messages that are going around all the time underneath the hood uh, and the standards that we put in place. Well, observability and management platform is the follow-on of enterprise manager. 
So if you're not familiar with Enterprise Manager or you haven't uh, haven't used it before, don't worry. We we have provided this open platform capability independent of Enterprise Manager. So it can give you the ability to go in and and observe all the logs. Uh, it give it, it by providing agent for both your applications and your, your database systems. You can monitor databases anywhere now um, in our cloud, somebody else's cloud, as long as it's an Oracle database. Likewise, we, we have templates for of in excess of 250 different types of applications that we've created for our management agents for you to deploy on your virtual machines and then with those coming through the service connector hub so that you get all the other uh, messages that are coming in they're all put together you can then we give you the capability of having operational insights and since we have an analytics engine we, we provide methodologies of using that analytics engine with these logs that said, you don't have to use our engine. You can use a third-party engine. You could, you can, it's Kafka um, compatible. So you can, any Kafka compatible streaming service, you can stream to that if you've already got something else in place. So the that's one part of it. The other part of it is we have in anything that has data in OCI now has our auto. ML and ML operations as part of that. So it has built in not only the logging, but the machine learning for pattern recognition. So that gives you a very easy anomaly detection. Surprises that might come about can be logged and acted on if no more than just an, e an email to you. So it gives you a pretty good process in place. And like I said, it's uh, it's more integrated now than it's ever been before. It's cloud native and with our traditional technology, but also with technologies that have been adopted in the last 10, 15 years in the uh, open cloud. So these are the kinds of, of logs that, you, that are available to you. So you have anything that's, and I'm gonna show you the audit page and you can search on those, those pages as well, but you can also send them somewhere else and and use a search engine or search technique that you want. Um, in the UI itself, it is somewhat limited. It only looks at a two week window. So if you're trying to guess where something happened in the last 365 days, then that can that can be problematic. But if you can use our, our uh, analytics engine, you can use some other tools that are out there to not the UI <laughs> to do a better search with respect to that. But it also includes all of our service logs, our gateway events, those are our routers, if you remember. Um, anything to do with uh, the functions, anything to do with the software defined network, the virtual cloud network, those all are available to you. Anything, any anomalies that you, any triggers that you put in place, we can we can pull that together as well. And the, and the real, er, interest can be is it is configured through a unified monitoring agent that you can configure uh, any of your uh, compute instances or resource directly to upload custom logs and through this unified monitoring agent. So it gives you a, a lot of capability to really have a thorough understanding of what's going on not in just simply an application, not simply in a particular database or a fleet of databases, but what's going on enterprise wide with your performance and your utilization of resources. So let's talk a little bit about that, right? So the, it, part of that is the service connector hub as noted before, third party observability tool can work with it because we use our Kafka compatible streaming service, um, completely complete visibility to all the raw data movement and nearly real time actions. 10 to 15 minutes, uh, if you consider that real time, <laughs> that's, that's, not quite, um, that's not quite as long as that, but it, it, there is a, a length of time just in the, in the turn, in and out. The longing, Logging analytics 
the data analytics and exploration tools that are available to you to easily visualize these processes. Um, we provide these um, dashboards, but they're completely editable. So if you like something or you don't like something, if you want to emphasize on one thing versus another thing, if you want to use a different type of heat map or a different type of a pie map, you can do that. You can edit it. And as mentioned, we have over 250 out of the box parsers for Oracle and non Oracle stacks. Anything that's Apache or Apache based or um, a number of other types of applications. If you remember, we have all our legacy ERP systems that are capable of doing that. So if you have something that's, you know, internally as a, a web page, you're, you're displaying to your internal customers or your external customers, we've got a parser for that. And of course, you also have uh, the, the ability to archive everything. Uh, typically, it's about a year, and then you download it into an object store, and then you can archive that onto tape, and you can keep it as long as you want, or your security requirements dictate, or your um, policies dictate from a governmental or a industry point of view. So as mentioned, the database management, complete fleet monitoring and management capacity, uh, your performance hub, so you have the view of your all your uh, diagnostics, including your ASH analytics, your SQL session details, and blocking sessions. So it's a very thorough system that sends you the data and gives you an insight into what's going on. Of course, with something like um, autonomous, you actually get that real-time SQL monitoring goes to a pattern recognition system, and it will make suggestions to you based upon performance of your data system on your cycle of calls to uh, get better performance over time. So this, of course, if you have all this information and it, you can look back 18 months uh, for your database in particular, um, you can get a really good idea of capacity planning. Of course, if you only have a month of data, it's going to give you a linear <laughs> regression analysis. But if you have a couple cycles, now it's going to give you that seasonality. It's going to give you the end of month surges. It's going to give you the kinds of things that you need to really understand throughout your business and how to plan for the future and to mitigate your costs and improve your performance overall on every aspect, not just your databases, but how your applications perform and the rest of it. So the audit calls are loggable, or excuse me, are logged and made available to you. The calls are via the console, the CLI or SDK. At the end of the day, underneath is a REST API call. So all of those are available to you and structured in such a way that you have access to. As I said, new events available in 15 minutes, 90 days of default, history and with a click it's 365 and after that you can dump it into uh, object store and then take it to uh, archive it on tape and then it's searchable via the console but I've done that <laughs> with troubleshooting for a customer and um, it works so let's take a look at a um, little bit of what the system looks like in actual use. Let's see if I if it's logged me out yet. No, I'm still in. So while, you can see while, while I think Lynn, you're you're trying to do that. I think I want to bring in Jason one more time, like you know, and ask him about um all the 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 monitoring capabilities you talked about from a database side and other other capability side. I want to hear from Jason, like you know, Jason, the companies have a lot of discrete tools for like, you know, to manage their ecosystem, whether it's monitoring or like, you know, for other operation uh, activities, right? What are the best practices OCI recommends? All right, that's a good one. And you guys have covered a lot of good topics today. So, so let me kind of just start from Oracle's approach is that we're going to support, you know, a lot of the open source and third-party software for analytics, for logging, for dashboarding, for the development or deployment of code. Um, and, and you'll see that, you know, both in what the guys are talking about today, as well as if you look at some of our documentation online, right? We support Terraform to be able to deploy out your infrastructure's code. 
We support things like Grafana and Prometheus when you need to build dashboards and you want to take the metrics, things like our monitoring service or our um, Kubernetes uh, control plane or mm -hmm. our um, you know, notification control plane. And you want to pull that into a centralized dashboard, which is pretty common for most customers, right? You're going to have more than one cloud provider. You're going to want to have a common tool set. Um, but you're going to see that we're going to support all the, you know, the, those tools that you already have today, you know, whether it's PagerDuty or Slack or ServiceNow or any of the things I mentioned before. And strategically, that's where we're going to continue to go. If you don't have a tool, we have cloud native tools to provide you this information to roll up the graphs and charts and logging the analytics. If you've already got a tool, you're multi-cloud, right? You're sitting in Azure, you're sitting on our platform, maybe someone else. You're going to be able to use a lot of the real estate you have today, right? A lot of the same toolage for um, deployments, for monitoring, for dashboarding, for alerting, all right? And we're going to provide you plugins. We're going to be able to provide you scripts. Some of these things you're going to see from Oracle on online. Some of these things you're going to see from GitHub. But that's where we're going as a company. We want to let you use your existing tools. We understand that most customers are going to be multi-cloud, and we'd like to do it in a way that's the most least disruptive as possible. So you don't have to learn new tools. But if you need tools, we'll provide them for you. And you should be able to just plug in what you have today to what we're able to offering in those areas. Thank you, Jason. Back to you, Lynn. Thank you, Jason. Uh... I was typing an answer to a question. <laughs> All right, so and now I'm going to talk to the question anyway because I'm going to and I'm going to cover part of this in the, in this process. So you can come down here using the the hamburger menu and come to observability observability and management, and that's where you'll find everything I've talked about so far this this afternoon with respect to the performance monitoring capabilities, uh, the the logging, the monitoring in general the logging analytics, the event service, database management, operational insight, management agent, Java management. You notice that some of these require ac actions for you to uh, take, like in the case of your management agent, to deploy these agents on the systems that you have and, co and connect them through the right ports to that um, hub so that we, we, we know where it, what's going on and where it is. Likewise, um, you, you have the service metrics capability here, the alarm status. Let's see, I think they've, they've got some example data here. You understand that this is a, a pretty um, unused system in, in the sense that it's just what I play with. So uh, metrics explorer here. Is, is so she just shows you some of the visualizations of what's going on, any alarm status, alarm definitions that you might want to put in place, your health checks. Then you also have, I, I got a question and I answered it, um, but I want to make sure it's, it's, it's not an uncommon question. So everything here is available to you uh, at essentially no cost because it's built into the system, right? Now, using logging analytics, does require some cost simply because behind logging analytics, you actually have a autonomous data warehouse that a small data lake put in place that brings in all the data from all the different logs and all the different logs from the from the um, excuse me from the service logs and the audit logs and the special custom logs. All that's integrated through that data lake. So, and they call it a data lake versus, versus simply a data warehouse because it, it has multiple data streams of different types. And the machine learning that I mentioned before will make some suggestions. In fact, much of this is already known. So it's going to do the ETL for you up front to allow the ingestion of this data in a rational manner that the analytics part can understand and display in the different dashboards and work through the administration. So there's a little bit of hand-waving magic in the background, but just think of it as a, an autonomous data warehouse plus the, our analytics engine as part of that. And the really, it, you're paying for only the functionality of that over the, uh, you have the rest of this, including the performance hub that's built in, but 
to get an insight through this system, through these dashboards. Um, it's it's uh, the, the fee is for that, the size of the database and the rest of it. So you can see some of these dashboards that are uh, put in place. Here's the Log Explorer um, that looks for, for different capabilities that you wanna put together. Um, Again, pretty empty at this point. Jason or uh, Anu, do you want to um, add anything at this point? You know, from the observability and manageability, way, you, you had an important point there about it costs you very little. And I, I just want to add some context to that because I know there are a lot of customers are, are very cost sensitive right now. When it comes to a little bit, what most customers are going to see from something like logging analytics and some of the services that may have to have, say, object storage behind it, you're going to see a monthly cost of tens of dollars, maybe hundreds of dollars if you've got a, a very large environment, right? Thousands and thousands of instances. But the, the cost of a lot of these observability and management tools is not going to be a significant cost for the environment for most environments, right? There are some edge cases where you could probably rack up some costs if not configured correctly. But it's going to be a minimal cost. There's going to be no cost at all. Thank you, Jason. Um, and, and of course, cost is reflected in value, right? So it, it, the idea is that we would we would hope if you're if you're looking at this as if it's providing some value to you, it's saving your time. A lot of the the point of this is by using letting the machine do the work as opposed to you doing the work in this process. It's, it's like uh, with our autonomous databases, we, everything is done sort of for you so that you can focus on gaining more insight on the data that you are collecting through, the, through other services or other forces, whether it be here in our logging analytics or through the application performance management or the database management or the operational insights. And, and if you get all this data, then of course, we, we have the capability of um, giving you suggestions with respect to uh, what to do where things are going. This is specific to your, your databases, your SQL warehouses, I was talking about your AWR hub, your, which you get your Atom Spotlight. There's a lot of different capabilities that you have with these systems. Um, and in addition to this, if you're familiar with um, some of the other tools that we have, we even give you some suggestions on your cost to uh, minimize your cost over time um, in the process. So that's really all I wanted to show. Is there any questions beyond what's already been written in? I think we've answered all of them. Let me stop sharing and I'll look what, and see what questions haven't been answered. I still got couple. Um, let's see. If you have pinned resources, notice they seem to disappear the next day. You can set uh, how long you want those uh, to stay. Uh, it also depends upon how often you hit them. So those are capable of being worked with in your, um, with your, um, uh, with your admi administrator. Let's see. If a customer wanted to utilize APM or LA stack monitoring and Dave, how ma many management agents would be needed to be deployed? Well, for your application performance management, it would be for in the virtual machines or containers that you were interested in for that particular application. For your st stack monitoring, that would be through, um, again, the combination of your management and your Java agents, depending upon the importance of the respective thing. For database management, it, you do not have to do anything because that agent is already, if it's an Oracle database, that agent is already deployed. All you have to do is turn it on. So when you, you go and look at your database, if you're running a database service uh, through us, uh, you'll see that there's a, there's a, a switch, if you will, to turn that database 
uh, agent on to provide that information. So we answered all the questions, Lynn. We have nothing else here. That's all that was written in. Thank you so much. Anyone has any more questions? This is your time. We still have three minutes, a little less than three minutes. So if you have questions, um, please put it in the Q&A and we can answer your question live. If not, we can wrap this up today. Awesome session, Anand, Lynn, and Jason. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and help with the session. Renee, let me, I had a previous question I wanted to just point out about if you're having a problem with your tenancy or mm -hmm. something else like uh, of that nature, remember that you can always come here and in the question mark for help, you'll see it gives you some documentation on now notice I was sitting here in operational insights so it gave me operational insights documentation uh, supported targets uh, looking at set up by groups users and policies um, rest API reference and then here if you if you have a problem that doesn't apply in, in the case of the actual question it was a one that really wasn't there then you just create a, a support request and go through the process of, of going through the support request so that you you get a get a sr and and put that in place for you and do not forget your sales team your sales team is there to help you provide you with information you have an eca assigned to you as well so make sure that you uh, take advantage of of those resources that we put in place for you awesome thanks for that len that was really helpful and I see that uh, Nick has already put the polls up. Thank you guys for responding to the poll. Your feedback is really important for us because that helps us improve the session quality. And we can also design the content based on the feedback that you're giving for the, the third poll that you answered just now. So with that, um, thanks again. Hope it was a good learning experience from all of you today. Um, and thanks again, Lynn, Anand, and Jason. And thanks everyone for joining. We look forward to see you again on May 16th for our next session, where we'll talk about multi-cloud and hybrid cloud deployments. You can find the details of our next set of sessions here. I'm going to put it on chat. Um, the first link will take you to the day one and beyond page. The second link is the alias where you can post your questions. If you have any questions, just email it to that alias and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions there um, on Oracle Cloud. Another re reminder is we are doing a hands-on lab session on uh, getting started with OCI uh, course services. If you want to sign up for that, here is the link for that. This is happening this Friday, um, May 5th at 10 a.m. PT. So go ahead and register for this if you want that, uh, if you want to be part of that hands-on session. With that, thanks again for joining us. See you all next time. Have a great day, everyone.